Here we go. Here we go. Hey, everybody. Welcome to Friday's Live QA. Everybody having a great week? I see there's a bunch of you guys already joining me. I was already kind of getting a sense of what everybody was posting just a second ago. How's everyone doing? Let's see. And uh, let's get into some good questions. I actually have a couple to start off the bat with, so I'm going to go ahead and, and start. Uh, the first is Phil Smith had two questions. I'm going to hit both real quick. Um, Phil said, too bad they're not making the PRS DC3 anymore. I agree, Phil, and especially when you know John Mayer is on board now. Think about this. I actually happen to know some of the backstory between about the DC3 and the NF3. Paul, Paul was really into strats around that time. That was about 2009 when those things popped. And he had some kind of 63 strat that he was really into or something. And, and that kind of motivated him to want to make a strat style guitar. And I think at the time, it wasn't the right timing for those guitars, right? Um, but now with John Mayer on board and the fact that Sir Guitars is doing so well and types of guitars, strat type high end guitars are doing so well, I think, I agree. I think you should bring them back. Um, so, and then uh, Ed Dana saying, "Hey, happy Memorial Day!" Um, thank you, Ed. It's a, uh, it's um. Memorial Day is always a thing. I always like to tell everybody. Um, it's a, uh, it's a. Uh, I'm a, I'm a veteran, and so Veterans Day is like our day. You know, uh, and Veterans Day is really supposed to be for soldiers that have fought in wars, and then we kind of morphed it into anyone who's just been a veteran, which, you know. Uh, is cool. And then Memorial Day is to always remember the ones we've lost, um, you know, and no matter what your country, right? I don't know. Uh, Memorial Day is a thing in the U.S., but if you're other countries, I'm sure you have some kind of memorial service. Unfortunately, every country's had some kind of conflict and had to do something. Cool. So so let's get to the gear side of it now. So we did that. And um, Lawrence is saying hello to everyone. And then so I want to hit Phil's second question. So Phil's second question was... Um, he was talking about the new Joyo Klons amp and that, and that's a great segue because believe it or not, uh, if you guys know who Henning is, Henning Pauling, um, I'll make sure when I do the live stream, I put the, the link to his channel. Um, Henning is a, a, an interesting cat because he's a great YouTuber, a great gear guy, a nicest guy I've probably met on YouTube and I've met a lot of nice guys on YouTube. So that's saying a lot. Um, but he is a master at getting stuff done and one of the things he's done lately is he's connecting a lot of youtubers together a lot of gear reviewers together in fact what he's about to do has never been done before so i don't i can't talk about it right it's a little ways out but it's really interesting but one of the things he did was since we've had some uh, some fun conversation together he contacted me i think last week and because he's in germany the time zone difference is funny so i wake up to his texts and um the first message he sent me was hey phil i'm gonna be checking out the uh joyo clans i talked to joyo they're sending you one to check out as well so uh, i have a joy i have a joyo clans uh amp coming if you're not familiar with this guys what phil's talking about there's a new amp and it's an interesting thing it's one of those things kind of like the line six um hd series it was hd or ht the tube amp series right where a company that makes basically inexpensive product is going to do something high-end the joyo clans is kind of pricey um but like you said, uh, like Phil was mentioning in his comment, it's supposed to be very innovative. It uses relays, um, and it's a tube hybrid amp. I think there's some preamp tubes in it, no power tubes. You know, this is something that's always been tried, and I think everybody always gets it about 90% right or 70% right, and it just never lands. And um, But the JoYo guys have really been trying. Uh, I and, and so you guys know, this is actually something that happens in gear often. Companies that make, uh, look at Ibanez. They went from making knockoffs of everybody's stuff, right? So they go, hey, look, we could do what everybody else does. We'll just do it cheaper. Bam. Then after a while, they go, hey, why don't we have an identity, <laughs> right? Once you have a skill set, you have good employees, you have good, 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 uh, good marketing, good uh, 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 manufacturing process. I think that's a, great, a next step. So will this be JoJo's, you know? Uh, next step or will it just be another thing we don't know but I promise you uh, I will do a really good honest review and like he mentioned Phil said that it comes out next month I, I got the impression I'll have it 
before it's available to anyone else or around that time. So soon. Uh, okay. The another question came from, and I said hi, but I can't pronounce it. Is it s- sometimes uh, it's satire? I'm going to say satire. Say, t- I don't know. I'm sorry if I'm butchering your, your name, but uh, I really apologize. Uh, S a t i r like say tire, say and then say ter ter. <laughs> so Seder. is it Seder? That would make sense, right? Um, Seder's question was. They ha- you have a seven string and you want to tune it to C. Would that damage the neck? Um, I'm assuming you're talking about tuning the entire seven string down a, a full step. So uh, E would go to D, B would go to C, and so on. You know, right? Not in that order, but you get the idea. Uh, no, that's fine for the neck. Sometimes when you down tune a guitar a full uh, step, the uh, the the lack of tension on the strings, uh, not pulling on the neck, the neck will kind of overbow or pull back and you will have to relieve the truss rod a quarter turn usually does it nothing to be scared of use the correct uh allen wrench and uh let's go so let's go to the next questions and like i said um let's scroll down and let's see if we can find some good questions and i really appreciate you guys tuning in so early i uh i didn't post whether or not fridays was coming because my daughter uh, did promotion today at, at her school. So uh, it's a big day. We have a lot of graduations and promotions going on in the family. So Jamie's saying hi from Scotland. Hey, Jamie, how's it going? And let's see. Uh, okay, so um, Here's a good one from Brian. Brian wants to know, why don't any manufacturers use locking tuners on acoustics? You know, Brian, the only acoustic I've ever seen that came standard with locking tuners is the Monty Montgomery Alvarez uh, Yagiri. Uh, And it's a $3,000 guitar. It comes kind of all beat up. Uh, I've always said this, you know, over and over again. If you don't know who Monty Montgomery is, check that dude out. He is one of my favorite guitar players of all time, if not my favorite. And um, his uh, Alvarez Yagiri acoustic comes with locking keys. Uh, to answer your question, Brian, um, he specced it that way, so that's why it comes that way, because he wanted it. Most manufacturers don't do locking keys because, believe it or not, the issue is weight. Um, now, why don't manufacturers take advantage of like the new open gear hip shot tuners and stuff that are open that are locking but lighter? I don't know, but a lot of the times the reason the issues is is everybody's had that acoustic, right, where you put the really nice Grovers on there and then this neck heavy. That's why you notice a lot of acoustics will have smaller uh, Grovers. It's just about a neck heavy. It's about a balance thing, right? The headstock can get pretty heavy pretty fast. That's the main reason, besides, of course, just being cheap and not wanting to spend the money. Um, plus, remember, not all the not all the electric guitar players have figured out locking keys, right? So acoustic players are definitely not going to be as into advancements as even electric guitar players are. You know, acoustic players by nature are traditionalists. They like things to be the way they were. So that's why manufacturers always have to kind of really push to try new materials, new concepts. So that's another reason as well. Um, let's see. Uh, what else do we got? Okay, so MB215 saying, Phil, I found out who's on that live show Saturday. It got leaked on TK show it with Pixie and Shane from in the blues, but I won't say nothing. I, I think it's okay. I don't think it's a secret MB 215. So you guys know tomorrow, um, I believe it's six o'clock my time. Uh, it is, I, I will be on in the blues channel, uh, live with, uh, the tone King. And I believe we have someone else joining us. I, I, I um, I'm not sure if that was confirmed or not, but it's the uh, three of us. We're just going to hang out for an hour and talk, right? Uh, you know, I love talking to Lewis. That's the Tone King anytime I can. You know, he is, like I said, one of the uh, original gear reviewer guys. I mean, I think most of us, if you've been watching gear reviews for any length of time, your first experience had to be either Chapman or, or the Tone King. There's a few others. Don't we? Gearman Dude. I mean, there's a ton of them. You know, Pete Thorne. But those two guys are definitely in that list every time. So... Uh, yeah, I'll be on there tomorrow night. I have no idea what we're going to talk about. <laughs> so we'll see. I'll try to have fun is, is basically is my plan. Um, let's, uh, next question. What do we got? Um, oh, Trevor's, uh, Trevor Garrison said, hey, Phil, EMGs are blackouts. 
I, I, I want to answer this question because I have a funny story. I had this guy uh, that used to come to, to the shop for repairs and stuff, and he is an, an old rocker veteran, and he was into the old American Jacksons, old Kramers, old uh, BC Riches, only American stuff, only stuff from the 80s, um, and really into it. I mean, all high-end guitars and very into EMGs. And um, what's funny was he would he, – he even – one time he brought me this um, – Neil Schoen guitar it was actually a Neil Schoen the the guitar was that brand, uh, Neil Schoen's model, and um, he he wanted EMGs put in. I put some EMGs in it. I'll never forget this. He gets the guitar and he's like, "This is horrible. I hate this." And um, so the funny story was we tried everything and it didn't work out. So I he decided in his head that old EMGs sound better. So I went on eBay, bought some old EMGs, put them in the guitar. He picks it up and he's like, "This is it. It's right." So from then on, for years, every time he got, bought a guitar and needed to pick us one in, I had to go on eBay, find old EMGs or a guitar with old EMGs that was cheap, buy the guitar and put EMGs in it. And I know this, it could be anything except for the fact that we would test his ears all the time and he would nail it every time. He could nail when they were old EMGs, you know, right? I would, I would say, hey, about this? And he'd be like, nope. How about this? Yep. And when he was right, it was the old EMGs. So when the blackouts became huge, they, they were really taking over market share. I started putting blackouts in a couple guitars and I gave it to him. And he first time he played them, he says, this, you know what they did? This is what he said. He said, they just knocked off the old EMGs. They got the formula right. Um, I don't know if any of that's true. I'm just <laughs> telling you what he said. But what I do know is then from then on, we just put blackouts in every time he bought a guitar and his guitar. So the answer to your question is, uh, I, 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 that is now in my head that blackouts have that old EMG sound. Uh, but without having an experience like he had, I couldn't tell you for sure. So, so there you go. Um, uh, oh, here's a good question. Mark, uh, 6506 says, Hey, Phil, have you tried the new EL 34 5150 head? Uh, I did. It was hissy. Uh, very, very noisy. Lots of saturation. It was a great amp. Uh, don't get me wrong. Um, I don't have a need to have more gain, <laughs> right? Like it had more gain that like the stealth does, and um, and it was uh, it was hissier, more hiss. Um, but it was fine. It was a good amp, right? I I didn't. It's not what I was hoping for. How about that? I was really hoping for the EL34 head to be a tame down version, more Marshall esque, and then the modern 5150 PV style amp. But you know they did what they did. They just basically you know, gave us a different version of that head. Um, and I, and I do like it. So I just didn't, you know, I didn't love it if that helps. And I didn't like the new price tag. Um, let's see, what else do we got? It says, Oh, you guys are really posting comments, <laughs> questions. Uh, Okay, here's another one. I know Trevor just got a question, but I'll answer this uh, next one too. He says, hey, Phil, I want to open a guitar shop in, in a relatively big town with a guitar center in it. Yes or no? This would uh, help a lot. Um, and then it says, thanks for your answer on the MGs. Okay, so so that's a great question, right? Uh, and a great subject to talk about. You know, do you open a store next to a guitar center? The, the answer is real simple. The answer is yes, you can open a guitar store next to a guitar center. The problem, though, is then you have to niche out exactly what they don't do. And that has gotten really difficult. There is a lot of stores in this country that were able to build their business model off the idea that Guitar Center wasn't doing repair, Guitar Center didn't do lessons, and Guitar Center really focused on mainstream products. So keeping off brands, you know, stuff like trainer amps and, um, you know, and... Uh, and Eden Bass amps, and you know, and 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 and, and Fuchs uh, amps, you know, right, and just anything like that, right? Just something different, you know, Nags guitars and Grosh, you know, Strats, you know, style guitars, just high-end stuff, unique stuff. Put that in there. The problem is guitar centers really tried to grab every market they can, you know, because they're like a clawing, they're like a what is it, a a, a clawing animal, you know, it's drowning. They're reaching out, so they they start repairs and they've started lessons. So it gets a little harder to put one next to them. Um, now that may not be specifically your question was to be next to them, but you're also saying it's a relatively big town, but they're there. The the, the guitar centers are tough because they are um, not predictable. 
You don't know what they're going to do. We don't know what's going to happen with Guitar Center. Those stores could close soon. Those stores could expand soon, right? You know, everybody loves to, to boast that Guitar Center is going to go out of business. The problem is, is they own the market. So, yeah, they could go out of business. However, that's real damaging to the industry. So there's a lot of people that would be willing to give them money to stay in business. So my answer to you is uh, if you can't do something unique or something that will be to get differentiate yourself from the other stores in town, I wouldn't do anything. So there you go. All right, here we go. Um, uh, Josh says, hey, Phil, thoughts on the Marshall Silver Jubilee reissue versus the original Jubilee? I've never done an A-B comparison. I I'm not real familiar with the Jubilee. What I remember about the Jubilee was no one liked it until Joe Bonamassa did. Guys, I know you guys want to comment on that one. It's true. I don't remember anybody. That's an, that's one of those amps that, man, that was that was gold if you had one. People bought them because they were cheap. You, you know, they weren't selling for top dollar no one wanted a silver marshall um and then all of a sudden all of a sudden joe bonamassa had one and then not only did everybody have to buy the old ones up they had to reissue it so it's not that it's not a great amp of course it's a great amp it's just you know uh i don't have a whole lot of experience because it wasn't an amp anybody was actually it wasn't a tone anyone was, at, was after for the most part for a while it kind of died off for a few years until he, he kind of rejuvenated that um and i really think that's where they messed up Right, I think they should have made a Joe Bonamassa Silver Jubilee model. They really should have done that. Um, my issue, my issues with the new one was they made the new smaller version head, but it's not very small. So, but it's still a very good amp. So, okay. So, okay, and and and, and uh, Satir is saying. Hey, Phil, I'm sorry about not clarifying. Okay, I meant tuning up from a low B to a low C and tuning all the other strings to G, C, F, A, D. Maybe I'm not understanding. Okay, let's make sure. So we go on B, you're gonna tune up that B string, right? So so you're tuning up to C. Um, would that damage the neck? It should not damage the neck, uh, but you gotta watch what string gauge you go with. I To be safe, stay with nine. So it should be like nine to 52. Um, and you should be fine. I don't see a whole lot of issue there, especially if the neck is maple. Um, it shouldn't be an issue. You will have to adjust that truss rod, like I said. And um, that's the only, th only thing I see. So let's see. Because um, remember, necks can take a lot more than people give them credit for. A lot of the problems is people see what crappy necks do and they just assume to all necks do that. Good necks, you know, they're almost impervious to what's going on with strings. Um, Oh, here's a good one. Donnie saying, hey, Phil, uh, bought a Marshall Mini Jubilee and sent it back after three days. Piece of junk. Have you checked it out? Please demo this. Couldn't get a good overdrive. Very muddy. You know, Donnie, I hate to say this. I checked it out at the NAMM show. It was so loud I couldn't hear it. And then I checked it out again at the Guitar Center. Thought I was not really feeling it. Didn't hate it. But I was like, eh, I don't know. I asked my buddy Joe. And he said, oh, I checked it out at the Guitar Center. I didn't like it either. And I go, oh, that's enough for me. Um, but again, Donnie, I think it's because I don't think it sounds bad that it's junk. I think it's, that's how the original head sounded, you know, um, not junk, just, it wasn't is this Joe Bonamassa is amazing, right? So, right. He's, he's the force behind that amp. Just like I think Slash played one for a while, right? I don't, so, so that, there you go. Okay. So here we go. Uh, Tumulator says, oh, I like this. Splawn or Friedman? Oh man. What a great question you guys don't know that's like that's a hard question you know why because Splawn is my first like wow a super marshal which is what i call friedman's there you know he takes marshals and he goes i'm gonna make them 10 percent better uh Splawn is the first 10 percent better than a marshal um i like friedman uh you know what though you know what it is for me I'm going to say Friedman, but only because of the price point. But remember, I play the small heads, so I don't play the big dollar ones. Um, but I bet you if we A beat them, the spawn would win. They're just they're just hard to beat. Um, <laughs> so here's a good one. Here's a crazy question. Hey, Phil, have you ever tried plugging in a Marshall 9-volt mini amp? You guys all know that little plastic amp, right? Into a bigger amp as a preamp. My sound's great through a super uh, champ clean channel. Yeah, why not? You know, so you know, me and Lawrence, when we were hanging out the other day, we were talking about that these mini amps, um, 
are basically just stomp boxes. Um, with uh, In fact, I'll tell you a little secret. So the guys at Dana Electro, they liked that review I did where I wore the hat. <laughs> So they sent me this, uh, and uh, they, you know, and they just sent it to me. They didn't ask for anything. They just sent it to me. I thought it was kind of cool, and I thought I should review this because this is the, this is a twenty thirty dollar little practice amp. It's the number one selling practice little plastic amp out there, and uh, so I thought I would mess with it. We were looking at it and we were laughing because it's basically just a distortion pedal with a little one watt chip in there that powers one. Um, in fact, uh, Lawrence even did the math on a calculator and he was figuring out that. Uh, Lawrence is here, so he can chime in. What did you decide? It was 120 milliamps. What did you decide? It was something safe, right, within range that you can output the, the thing into an amp. So why not? Uh, and especially you're probably running the amp uh, headphone out into the into the amp, right? So why not? It's just a distortion pedal at that point. Um, let's see. Uh, hi Phil, have you ever looked into Collins Electrics? Uh, as high-end alternative to a Les Paul RDS 335. A good friend of mine, Tyler, has a Collings. It's a really amazing guitar. I think he paid six grand for it. And um, I played it for five minutes. It was one of those guitars that when I was playing it, uh, it was, it was, you know what it was like for me? It was like my friend, I don't have a friend but that bought a Lamborghini, but it's like a friend who buys a Lamborghini. He's like, do you want to test drive it? You're like, no. Other, I'd like to touch it and say I touched the Lamborghini, but I'm never going to buy this, so I, I don't want to like it. That's how the Collings were. They're amazing. Um, and so as an alternative to Les Paul, I would imagine they're better because they're more expensive and they seem better quality guitars. So there you go. Uh, let's see. Um, 502 of us hanging out today. So I really appreciate you guys joining me and hanging out. Um, let's see. Okay, so Krusty's got a Krusty Buzzer said 59 Fender Twin, high power. Your thoughts on why they're so special and should I sell mine? No, Krusty, you shouldn't because here, here's the deal. I, I've, I've come to the conclusion that the old Fender amps, you um, it, 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 think of it like, like restoring an old vehicle, right? If you have to put money into it and you don't love it, you should let it go and let somebody fix it up. If yours is working fine, it's not going to hurt it to sit. I mean, the caps dry out and stuff, but it's it's fine. Keep it. Um, it's only going to go up in value. Those old amps are only going to go up in value. You know, think about this. There's a lot of theories out there. I, pre I subscribe to the theory that if Axe FX and, and, and um, you know, and Kemper and all those guys end up winning... Those old amps will be even worth more because in a world where anybody can have any tone at their fingertips, the only thing that will be valuable is the untangible, the, you know, right? The mystic, you know, right? So I think old amps are going to be probably end up becoming more valuable than even old guitars. I, I'm not saying that's a fact. I'm just saying it's, it's possible because, you know, everybody's going to have, you know, if you want a vintage 59 Fender or if you want a vintage Marshall, you'll just dial in your Axe Effects and you'll go, there it is, until that guy brings out the real one. And then you go, well, maybe that's not what it is. And if it is, it still will be cool holding that amp. So I say don't get rid of it. Um, it's it, just put your, just put a, get a smaller amp and have fun and keep that one in the background. Um, let's see. Uh, Lucas has got a crazy question. Let's see what it says. Lucas says, hey, Phil, if you had a million dollars to spend on guitar equipment, what would you get? A million dollars, Lucas? Really? A million dollars? Um, I would buy a guitar center. <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, I, a million dollars? It's one of those questions that you can't answer because you don't know until you have it. I can tell you exactly what I would do. If I had a million dollars to buy guitar equipment, right, just guitar equipment, I would buy, I would go out and find myself a, uh, a Ibanez uh, Universe in perfect condition, mint, and then I would grab probably two or three other cool guitars that are, to me, nostalgic. Um, you know, probably, you know, I don't know, I'm trying to think of something else, right? Just anything cool, right? Just something that was like, just this thing that I thought was cool. Probably like two or three of them. Then I would take the rest of the million dollars and I would go buy a ton of guitars and amps for schools or any kind of programs and help them out. And 
That's and only because I'd rather see people play music than, you know, right? I think I have enough crap now. So, in fact, so it's hard for me. I've really worked hard to get where I am collecting and I've gotten to the point now where I've I'm down to I've tried and I've bought what I've wanted and um you know, I still like the journey, but so there you go. Boring answer, but there it is. Uh Outlaw712 said, Phil, what happened to Jackson? I don't know. Did something happen to Jackson? You mean the brand? You know, it didn't go anywhere. Do you mean like, uh, clarify on that. Uh, that's a good, uh, you might have a great question there and I want to talk about it. Um, <laughs> what do you, okay, Fred uh, Fred Coulson says, what what I do for an old grill amp, not to play it, just to add it back to the collection. It's right. It's nostalgic, right? I mean, it's a time that no one's gonna have anymore, right? I mean, I, I chuckle, right? I mean, I you know, like I said, all amps are good now. They have to be because why would you buy a junk amp if you're a kid if you could just plug into your iPhone, right? I mean, you could just get iRig on your iPhone and it'll interface and play in that. I'd play if I was a kid now. So if there's any kids watching this, if I was a kid now and I didn't have a good amp. Man, this phone is it. I'd get an iRig, go find one used on Craig's for 30 bucks, plug my guitar in that and have every tone ever. Then plug that through a Bluetooth speaker and you're done. So, um, <clears throat> let's see. Uh, oh, uh, KW's got a great question. Phil, how does the Fender ProSonic compare to the SuperSonic? You know, the Pro ProSonic is this... Um, this uh, mystical amp. If you guys don't know, Cro ProSonics were an amp. I think they were developed or built, designed by Bruce Zinke of Zinke Amps before he left Fender. And so the ProSonics, like one of those Fender amps that just people love. They have a diehard following. Um, my buddy Joe had one, and I've messed with them too. And to me, I always remember the ProSonic being way better than the SuperSonic. And then when you put it in practice and you AV them again, what you were, what you find out is that's probably true in the live situation because the ProSonics just got a you know, a veracity to it, but the supersonic for home use to me is, is fine. Um, so it, I can only tell you this, uh, KW, if I was going to pick one for myself, it'd be a supersonic. So there you go. But the pro sonic again is in that category. What I told you about amps that are, that's definitely a collector's item amp. It's cool. If you have one, keep it. Um, the, um, RMG 471 says, Philip PRS SC 594 versus Gibson R8. I don't know the answer. I haven't got my PRS SC 594 yet. Um, so when I get it, I, I'll do some shootouts with a, with some Les Pauls and we'll see. We'll see. Um, Joe. Oh, okay. So Joe saying, uh, Satchton is saying Helix is great, but presets bad in my humble opinion. So guys, I'll let you know a little secret uh, in the retail biz uh, on that. When you get modeling amps or processors, my experience has been that the presets are not bad, they're over the top. See, the, the, I, I believe the, the marketing logic is that when you're in the store, they want you to plug in and have an experience like, whoa, that flanger, whoa, that delay, whoa, that distortion. Everything's gotta be like a, right? So think of it this way. I love this analogy, so I'm going to use it. It's like if you made chocolate squares, and but the samples you gave out to people, you put extra sugar in them, so when they had them, they were like, wow, that's really flavorful. But if you ate three of those chocolate squares, it'd be a little like, oh, you know, that's just too rich for my blood. So what they do is they, they're almost, they're making you samples that they know are too sweet. They're too intense, but they know that's how they're going to sell the idea. And then in a world now where a lot of us are just ordering it and getting it in the mail and checking it out, we're at home. So you're very rarely going to find good presets because the presets aren't set so much on what they think you're going to want to play. They're set to sell you on an idea. Um, uh, 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 Satir says, Hey Phil, why did Washburn take a dive in popularity? You know, uh, that's an easy question because Washburn's never been popular. They have had ups and downs and they are a company that's plagued there's a lot of companies like this. Washburn's one of the oldest, if not the oldest, acoustic guitar company in the world. Okay, um, and but the problem is, is I, I since I've been dealing with them, which is you know 12, 15 years, they've had three or four owners, <laughs> right? Totally different owners, totally different companies. So Washburn's been a company that's been handed off, and and let's be honest, they 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 get. Uh, 
Paul Stanley to come back for a little while, and then he's back to Ibanez. Uh, they get a couple guys like Dan Donegan. They pretty much got Nuno Bentoncourt, and Nuno Bentoncourt. Let's be honest, he's he's amazing, but man, he's not you know he's not Eddie Van Halen in popularity. So Washburn's never been able to seal the deal. In the '80s, they did some experimental stuff, um, and I always feel that Washburn's big problem is is that they really should pick right. Every company wants to be everything. Right, they want to be like the best acoustics, the, you know, the best electrics, bass guitars, but you know, companies that are smart like Taylor. Well, for a while until they did electrics and then they got back. But Martin and Taylor are smart. They're like, we do acoustics, right? And even Paul Reed Smith has learned, you know, he he can he can build a great acoustic, but he really should focus to electrics, right? There's there's very few companies like Fender that can do amps, guitars, you know, basses, or Gibson who can do acoustics and electrics, um, and Washburn really has not learned. Let's just pick a road, right? To me, if you're going to be one of the best acoustics on the market, like I think Washburn is, one of, they they win every year, like best, best under $500 acoustic. And then, but if you go to their website, it's all death metal guys. Look how you just divided your customer base. You have all these guys that are like, hey, I, I'm looking for a decent $500 acoustic. And when I think of that, here's a death metal guy. It is horrible marketing. Washburn's always had it. I've always had an affection for Washburn. I look past that, but I think for the whole part, it's been that way. And I think it's it trims over. And I think that actually got uh, cross-pollinated because they own Randall. And I think Randall had the death metal guys, right? Because they got Dimebag, and, 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 then, and then they went down that road. And then they just started going, hey, you know, Dan Donegan were disturbed. How about, you know, got Randall's. How about Washburn's? And again, lack of focus. So, um Rocker one two three four. Are you a drummer, Rocker one two three four? Because <laughs> uh, that's how you. That's that's how many things drummers count to. So any experience with Diamond guitars? No, I've emailed Diamond and tried to reach out to them, Jeff Diamond, because uh, I'm curious about the guitars. Haven't really heard anything back. Um, almost bought a Bird of Prey two or three times, but to be honest with you, my problem with Diamond guitars is every time I go to buy one, they don't have it in stock. So that's my experience. And then probably when they get it in the stock, I'm out of money. So, you know, because does anyone have that problem too? I have gear money and then when I don't have it, it, I don't have it. Sometimes I get money and sometimes I don't. Um, Let's see. What else do we got? Let's see what else. Good questions you guys got for us today. Let's see what can we talk about. Uh, And all right. Oh, Nathan's got a good one. Pretty sure Wayne from Wayne's World rocked a Washburn. I believe so, too. I think that's what he had on, on Wayne's World. Until, of course, uh, you know, he got that Strat. <laughs> right? Uh, you know, he, he got the infamous white Strat. You know, uh, interesting fun fact for you. Since Wayne's World, you know, right? He said the, oh, yes, it will be mine, white Strat. You know, the white Strat is the number one selling color for Fender right now. And it's been that way for years and years, the white strats. So you always wonder, it's like Hendrix, right? Jeff Beck had a white strat and then Wayne, <laughs> right? Could be possible. Could he, right? Did he, did he mess with us? Did, you know, you got to think about that for a second. You know, we all saw that movie. Did it really affect us? Um, you know, it could have, right? It could have been a little manipulation of him saying it's the Holy Grail of guitars. And then all of a sudden, all of us are like, yeah, we must have it. Um, Somebody said Wayne had a BC Rich. So the, for the record, Wayne had a lot of guitars, but I, I'm really sure you're, uh, the, the first person was right. If you look, g- Google it, I'm really sure the very first Wayne skits, he was holding a Washburn as well. And then later BC Rich. And then I think, I picture him with a Charvel, but I think it's that Washburn. And then, of course, he had the Strat and all that stuff. But, um, yeah, I I, um, I can imagine he had a lot of stuff. But I know for a fact he had a Washburn because... Um, I was really into Nuno Bentoncourt when Wayne's World came out. And so anytime I saw a Washburn, I thought it was exciting because you never saw him. Um, let's see. Nathan says, made me get a white Strat BC uh, of the movie. Ha <laughs> ha. Right? Yeah. So Trevor wants to know, do they still make uh, fenders in Japan? Yeah, it's just they're not really available to the U.S. So those of you uh, watching today over on, on the other side of the pond in, in Europe and stuff, you guys could probably speak up, right? You guys get a lot of Fender Japan guitars, right? So um, we just don't get them here in the U.S. It's very rare. Um, 
uh, some models come here. Uh, I believe the Richie Kotzen uh, telly is uh, made in Japan. The Marcus Millers used to be made. No, Marcus Miller's gone now. I'm sorry. The Getty Lees used to be made in Japan. Now they're made mo- moved to Mexico. Um, you know, I, I think it's a, a cost issue. So they move Japan to Europe and not Japan to the U.S. It's very rare. So, but they still make them. In fact, there is Fender Japan. That's a subsidiary of something a Fender. I don't know what's different about it. I'm sure it's. Uh, I don't know if it's owned by Fender and it's just Fender Japan or if it's it's a third party that Fender has. But uh, Lazy Boy said he called it Excalibur. Yes. Yeah. Right. So. Um. Joshua says, "Hey, opinions on the Seymour Duncan duality? I haven't tried it. Um, I should probably contact those guys. I I'm about to do uh, well. I'm I'm about to do a pickup video. In fact, in the other room, I have all the pickups uh, for the tech tips video. The next tech tech, tech tips video is a pickup video, um, and it, boy, it's been a workout to get all the pickups that I needed to do that video. Um, let's see." Um, Oh, yeah, you know, Shut Up, Let's Talk says, I love those Washburn X-Series strats. Yeah, Washburn's, right, right. Washburn is, uh, you know, if you go through time, they, they made some fantastic guitars. Just like I said, they just, as a company, they just make decisions that probably aren't the best. Um, okay, RMJ said, I was in Tokyo. This is a good question, so I want to share it with you guys. I was in Tokyo, and I didn't see any new Fenders, just old ones. Well, RMJ, I have a secret for you. So what used to happen in the store was um, there was always every every couple months, like every quarter, um, the first time it happened was kind of strange. Two um, two gentlemen would come in the shop, and they were definitely from, from like Japan or, 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 you know, like Tokyo, right, Japan. And they would just buy anything that you had. And I mean, if you had a Japanese era uh, boss pedal, they'd buy that. If you had old, you know, vintage stuff, they'd buy that up. They'd come to your store. Sometimes they would just put a list and put it on your counter. And then they would buy whatever you had, right? You'd ring it up and they'd give you an address. And it was always to ship to Long Beach, which was the shipping container that they were shipping all the stuff to uh, Japan. And so I would talk to other store owners. And what I found out was, yeah, these these same guys were just traveling the country. So they do that, you know, right? They they have high headhunters and they would go, they go through the And so, you know, that's why if you look, Look, certain guitars are gone here in the U.S. They're gone. Try to find a BC Rich Gunslinger or, or an Outlaw guitar. Those guitars are gone, right? All those, right? They just gobble them up. They go, those, they have lists and they just gobble this stuff up and it goes. And so RMJ, you can attest to this, right? So when you went to Tokyo, those stores though that have old ones are massive. How many, how many old guitars there? You go in there, you don't find an old Strat. You find every old Strat. They buy up everything. So all the good stuff is there. So yeah, I can understand that. Um, Let's see. Next one. Um, Let's get a good question. Can you disassemble a guitar blindfolded? Oh, wait, hold on. I don't want to lose that. Can Can you disassemble a guitar blindfolded like a soldier with his rifle? No. I mean, maybe a Strat, right? I mean, you could take it in a Strat all the way down to every component with pretty much a Phillips screwdriver. Um, but no. <laughs> and um, and and for the record, I was in the Army, so they didn't make me take apart my weapon blindfolded. I think the Marines are the real guys that have to do that stuff. For for us, they were just happy if we didn't, that we, you know, because I, I was in infantry, so once I was done with a rifle, I never saw one again except for once a year qualifications. Um, let's see, 557 of us hanging out, so that's pretty cool. Let's see what we got here. Um, uh, I, I just want to say his name correctly. Uh, I'm gonna say, I'm gonna say Sitch because the last name's Sitch. Sitch says, Hey, Phil, what do you think about scallop fretboards? I hate them. 
<laughs> and um, but I highly recommend everybody try them. Um, I used to carry a. Uh, I have a, a funny story. I used to carry the Inkpe Strat in the shop for years, and we would keep it for like every six months, and then we'd sell it at a loss just so I could let people try one out because you never saw them. And um, that went on for years. The problem was was uh, they used to come in blue, right? And they come in white, and they come in red. And then Fender cut down the selection to the off white. And when they cut it down to one color, it got hard because you had to buy the same one every time. It wasn't exciting. But um, what I, for me, scallop fret boards like the Ingve Strat, they feel like the action's really high. That's what it feels like to me when I'm playing it. It feels like really high action. It's just not my thing. The gems that I have have the scalloped uh, frets, the last four. It's okay, but to be honest, I really don't play up there. So it's not my thing, but I have, I have a, a, to me, and I think you could achieve it with really tall frets. I don't think you have to have a scalloped fretboard to do it. Um, I think if, if you can, if the, to, the fret's tall enough and you can't touch the, the base of the fretboard, then that's going to feel the same. But some people love them. Most people don't. But either way, it's something you should try. Because uh, mostly because if you haven't tried it, it's not what you think it is until you try it. So there you go. Um, let's see. I uh, jumped again. Okay, sorry, guys. I'm trying not to lose a bunch of questions. Um, Jim, want to know what's my opinion on carver guitars? I don't have one yet. I'm, um, you know, I, I have a little experience with them. Um, I'm really interested. I saw the Tone King's video. If you haven't watched it, it's fantastic. The Tone King did a, a factory tour of Kiesel's factory. And I like it because it's really a polarizing video. Half the people thought Jeff Kiesel looked like a, a jerk and the other people thought he was really passionate. I thought he was passionate, right? Um, it's really, he, because people don't really understand what he was saying in the video. He's third generation of the Kiesel family, the carving guitars. Third generations are usually who ruin the business. So he's basically saying, you know, he's trying not to toot his own horn, but he's basically also trying to tell you, look, I'm really passionate. I promise not to screw the company up. Um, and he didn't say it that way, but that's what, what it, I'm sure the grief he gets is that he's going to be the one that kills the company because he's third generation. Um, and if anything, I think they, you know, their, their decisions lately have fixed the company. Uh, they were making, you know, they were they were dying, like a lot of companies, I, I thought, in my opinion. Uh, Carbon was not something I thought about until Kiesel came out, and now it's, uh, everybody talks about it all the time. Um, let's see. Um, so here's a question. Uh, so, so JLD Crank says... Would you rather run a uh, profiling amp or a cab sim load box type thing? Um, that's a good question. You know, right? Because the, the torpedo uh, cab simulator thing is really cool. I think cab simulator. I'd rather do that. Because I, 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 I still, there's something about tubes that I'm still just drawn to. In fact, I've spent most of the week on solid state amps this week. And I figured it out for me. You know, right? Because sometimes you forget, right? Solid state amps are great, but the clean channel, there's something about tubes in the clean that just are smoother to my ear. Um, Jazz James 616 says, Hey, I know you're a big bowling for soup guy. Do you like Blink 182? I do, right? Um, probably, that's probably who I knew. Well, no, I, I, I like all that, what I call nerd rock. I love Weezer, Blink 182, uh, Green Day, Bowling for Soup, um, Happy Punk Rock, right? Pop punk rock um but i call it nerd rock it's like all music about how the dudes are just nerds <laughs> right and nobody loves them and i just love that um uh just because it's funny right who doesn't want to you know sometimes i like listening to stand-up comics and i like listening to music and to me sometimes punk rock's like listening to both they tell you a funny story you get to hear some rock music it's it's a it's a win-win uh uh Lewis B 88 said that's on the Eric Johnson strat. I will tell you right now that is the absolute best strat the Fender has ever made. It's just amazing in every way. Um, I'm not a lacquer fan and I still love it. Uh, so the question is, why don't you own one? I, I don't know why I don't own one. I, I don't, it's one of those guitars. Um, and I hate to say this, probably the main reason I don't own an Eric Johnson strat is because I have a Nuno strat guitar and I have a Steve Vai guitar and I have an Eddie Van Halen guitar. I had some George Lynch guitars that I got rid of. So after a while I start feeling like, man, I'm going to have everybody's artist guitar and it just felt silly. But to be honest with you, that's the one you should own. It's an amazing guitar. Um, you know, it's just a great, great, great guitar. 
So, uh, uh, Faye Vin says, what do you think of Revan guitars? You know, I reached out to Revan. They were very nice. They said they are going to try to send me a guitar and loan it to me to check it out. So I'm very excited about that. Um, I'm working on a video series. It's called Five Guitars, but it's five videos. Five guitars that are alternative to Fender Strats. So these are guitars that if you, you know, and I'm going to try to compare them and tell you what I think and which one do I like. And so, and uh, by price category. So, the the you know if it's a three hundred dollar guitar I compare it to a Squire if it's a five hundred dollar guitar it's a Mexican Strat it's a thousand dollar guitar it's a Merrick Strat so that'd be fun I told them the idea they said cool and they said they're gonna send me something um, and then it kind of you know fizzled off because they didn't follow back with me and I've been kind of busy but I will follow up with them next week um, is it's in my calendar already huh here's a great question. SG Flying V, have you ever been scammed on a guitar purchase? Oh man, boy, have I. Both as a customer and as a dealer. I've been scammed every way you can think of being scammed as both the customer and the dealer. You can't have this much stuff. I've been collecting since I was 15. I have one rule, I've steadfast on it. My wife uh, is, is, uh, was a good friend of mine since we were 13. And so we were friends for many, many, many years before we dated. Um, and she she understood, because she understood as a kid what I was doing. I never have sold a piece of gear unless I bought other gear. Um, so when I sell a piece of gear, like if I was to sell a pedal today, that goes in an account and that just money has to go back to, towards gear. And if you're a collector of anything, that's how you collect, right? It's like a, it plumes out. You, you know, you, you trade one card for two cards. And then when you sell those cards, you take that money and right. So it just kind of plumes, you know, I'm not, I'm not uh, rich by any fathom of the imagination. Um, but I am, I am, uh, I'm a collector and I'm very focused on what I like. I don't collect anything else. I'm not into anything else except for van shoes. I have lots of van shoes, but, um, but let's be honest. I don't have a collection of van shoes. I just have vans. But, um, so anyways, uh, so the question is, have I been scammed? Yeah. In fact, so many times I wouldn't even know which one to tell you. Um, it, it happens all the time. Uh, I've never had anything like where I thought it was a Les Paul and it wasn't or a Strat. I've never had a fake like that. Um, most of the scams are what everybody else gets. You realize you bought something that had a problem and not only did they just not disclose it, they were kind of, you know, a little, a little trickery, you know, trying to, right? Um, in fact, so many times that I've learned now, whenever you buy anything used, you have to figure out what the motivation to get rid of it is. You have to, right? Um, and um, it gets scary when the motivation is that it's, it's a problem, right? Um, in fact, you know, I'll tell you the scam that I see the most that, that bugs me. You're doing repairs. A guitar will come in and they'll, they'll say how much to fix it. And I'll go, well, the guitar is only worth 150 bucks, dude. Um, I'm going to charge you $200 to fix it. Don't fix it. Just, you know, it's dead. Just get a new guitar. And then every time, cause I surf Craigslist, it'd be like within 24 hours, that guitar is on Craigslist for $200, but no disclosure of what was wrong with it. And then I've had this happen to me personally. Uh, as a tech, I have told somebody guitar is bad. They have left the shop. And then a week or two later, another person comes in with that guitar. They just bought it and they're having the same issue. And I'm like, yeah, I just, and I hated it because almost every time we would cut the labor or whatever we do to make the, the, you know, cause you can't do anything. They didn't have the person's phone number. The person just walked into my shop. I don't have their phone number. So, you know, you do what you can. So, um, I had one Christmas, a person came in with a ukulele that they bought Christmas Eve for a gift on Craigslist. They went to tune it and the bridge popped off. They brought it into the shop and it was hot glued on. And they, they, they basically convinced my wife, you know, or I didn't convince her. They just told her what happened. She felt so bad that she came up to me and she goes, you're going to fix this in the next four hours. And I'm like, so I did an emergency, uh, <laughs> restoration on a ukulele. That was probably worth 60 bucks. I probably put about $125 worth of time and labor into it. Um, and I think my wife charged him 20 bucks, but it was Christmas Eve. What do you do? You can't, what do you, right? You can't be that guy that just let some kid get their cool ukulele. Um, and if I probably could have sold them a ukulele and did something, you know, help them in some other way, I would have done it that way. But there was just no way. They already they already paid too much for that uke. It just went bad. So bad things happen to people. Um, my, my, my always opinion on that is always research what you buy. If you don't know what you're buying, don't buy it. Right? Um, so let's see. 
Uh, Dries, Roy, Roy, I have no idea. I'm going to say Dries. It says, could you tell us more about your time in the Army? Sounds interesting. It wasn't, <laughs> right? Um, I will tell you the only funny thing about the Army for me. I, uh, I was working in a music store. I was going to school for music at the community college, you know, woo-hoo, and not knowing anything about the world because I was young and, uh, you know, recently out of high school. And uh, I thought I had a plan, but the plan was really to go go into debt for school and work at this music store. And um, uh, but it wasn't a music store; it was actually an organ store. They sold piano organs, but not pianos, just organs. Anyways, recruiter is talking to me, and I didn't know he's recruiter. And he's like, "You seem like a smart guy." I'm like, "Oh, no one's ever called me smart guy before." I mean, not really, but you get the idea. And he's uh, long story short, the next day I took a test, and I was in the army. That's my army story. Um, enjoyed it. Uh, and uh, what can you say? Let's see. Um, what was my MOS in the army? I was 63 hotel. So I worked on uh, big tr- trucks, just big things, right? Um, you know, if you're in the, if you ever in the army, you know, sometimes you don't do what you're supposed to do. I had an MOS that I didn't really do what I was supposed to do. They allocated me somewhere else. Um, so there you go. Um, I, okay, here's a good one. The Floyd says, I like 6,100 frets instead of scalloping. Exactly what I was saying, right, Floyd? It, it's it's You could put tall frets on a guitar and feel the same way. So, yeah. So, uh, yeah, try that. Uh, try that if you're thinking about that. Uh, uh, Faye Vin says, best fuzz for stoner metal. Um, you know, I've been asked this question before, and I didn't know the answer other than to say I would use something really like a big muff, something, right? To stay, I would not do a fuzz face, do something like a big muff, something that really dominates the sound. So, oh, okay, it jumped because there's 589 of us. So, that's awesome. Let's see what we got. Uh, Oh, okay. U.S. American Made Guitar says, I was a 11 hotel trained at Sand Hill Fort Benning. Oh, yeah. Okay. So I was at Aberdeen Proving Grounds, which is in Maryland, uh, which actually I was in Edgewood, if you know where that is. Uh, that's where I did my MOS training. And um, and it was very exciting. Uh, um, it was good to go to Maryland. It was cold. And being from Arizona mostly, it was really cold. <laughs> so... Um, Okay, Jillian says, uh, you have the Marshall 20 watt hand wired reissue. I did. I finally got rid of it. And I've owned it twice. I, bu- I bought it, sold it to a friend because he loved it. I uh, regretted selling it and bought it again. But um, I-, I never lost money. I bought it for, I think, a thousand, sold it for a thousand, bought it again for a thousand, sold it for a thousand. Um, how did you like it? Um, I had an original 1971 in 1979, and my memory was, uh, and my memory has blown it up. What are the. What are the reissues like? Uh, it is tube. Yes, it is tube. And yes, that's what happened to me. You know, right? Um, this is something, right? This happens to you. You you have something and then you go, well, I have other stuff. It's not that amazing. You get rid of it. And then exactly what you said, your memory of it becomes so great, right? You're just like, oh, that was such a good amp, right? So I got it again. And then you get it and you go, yeah, what was I thinking? Get rid of it. And then a year later, you're like, yeah, I don't really use this. <laughs> so that's what it was. It was cool. You know, you know what it was for me at low volumes? I can't tell a huge difference from the class five. Two good friends of mine literally uh, tell me the opposite thing. Every time I would play it, one would say the class five be- was better and the other one said the other and better. And after a while, I realized the class five is 250 bucks. So that's what I did. I just kept that. Um, uh, Dino uh, Locker says, any tips for buying an acoustic guitar? Yeah, Dino, um, but it's too hard to do in a a live uh, stream. So let me give you some important things to know. Acoustic guitars, um, for the most part, uh, are are very problematic because when they go down, when they go downhill, they go like it's bad things happen. So um, I'm trying to think of a a kind of wise tidbit, you know, without just giving you the whole thing that takes too long. Um, The most important thing you got to do is uh, get yourself a a mirror, right? Um, I have one right here. Hold on. I keep some tools right here. And what I use, sorry guys, 
Get yourself one of these. Little mirror you get at AutoZone. And look inside the acoustic. Okay? Uh, that's This is cheap. You can go to Harbor Freight. If you have Harbor Freight, get one of these. Uh, that's Whether or not you work on guitars or not, it's important to be able to look inside an acoustic. A lot of things that go wrong in acoustic happen internally. A lot of times when people talk about cracked tops, what you don't realize is most tops crack because the bracing breaks free. So the bracing will actually break free. Then all the weight of the tension of the strings is pulling on that, you know, that eighth of an inch top and it cracks. So when people look at a cracked top, they're looking at the top. They think that's where the problem starts. There's, they inspect that. But the problem starts in the structure inside. So look inside. If you don't know what to look for inside, let me know. Maybe I'll make a video about that. But that's where I start because setups, fret sprout, all that stuff, man, that's a setup fee. That's 50 bucks. Cracked bracing, cracked tops. Now you're getting into the territory where it's either not worth to do with the guitar or it's going to be expensive. So there's that's what you look for. Okay. And we're at the 10-minute warning. So let's see what we got. Um, Bill says, are you playing a band now? No, man. If I had free time, I'd probably do it. I just I don't. Somebody says, go have a beer on me. Thank you. That's uh, JLD Crank. So uh, he just gave me 10 bucks, man. That's pretty cool. It's like a tip jar for... Uh, this is that, uh, it's called, um, what's it called? It's called, um, uh, I forget what it's called. It's a new thing on YouTube, but uh, you can tip YouTubers. So I appreciate it. I will I will do just that tonight. Uh, so, uh, and that's that's the good beer, 10 bucks, <laughs> right? You can get, right? Um, let's see. Uh, oh, okay. So for, uh, for an acoustic humidifier and quality case, uh, oh, so that's a question I take it. Was that the question? What's a good humidifier? Um, I am. It's tough for me to answer the question. I live in Arizona. It's 101 right now. So advice I would give you, first off, I tell everybody is advice on a guitar for acoustics is regional. Where you live in the world is what you need to pay attention to. So we we have humidity issues here. It's hot. It's dry. You know, Arizona, it's a dry heat. We have central air systems. If you're not familiar with those, they're AC units that basically dry out the air on top, on top of that. So it's very dry here. So humidity, my advice here in Arizona is there's no such thing as over humidifying your guitar. It's impossible. Um, but other people, other places, it could become a problem. Um, uh, Alex is from Australia. Australia has got the same problem. In fact, here's the problem with acoustics, so you know. You know, think about this. People get upset about how acoustics are made because, you know, they crack a lot. But the problem is, is this, you know, there's only so many parts of the world that have a problem. It's Arizona, parts of California, Nevada, parts of Utah, and parts of Texas, like that desert area of the United States. Okay, so there's us, Australia, and then parts of like India, right? But believe it or not, guitars are not huge there yet right? It's still not a dominant force like it is in the U.S., right? And Europe. So the problem is, is manufacturers really can't, and this goes for electric guitar companies too, they really can't worry about dry climates when the majority of the guitars aren't going to them. So there you go. Uh, Colorado too has got some dry air. So you get the idea. So um, it's hard to answer that question. You have to do it regionally. That's why sometimes I don't do a humidity, I don't have a humidifier video, because I don't want to give somebody that lives in a in a different climate the wrong advice. Um, let's see. Um, here's good. Let's grab a couple before we go. How would you set up a simple? Oh, great one, Peter. This is a great question. How would you set up a simple, effective practice area if you were starting from scratch, Peter? That's a great, great question. In fact, um, guys, I really hope you pay attention to this. This is uh, the thing that kills your practice time: is not having an effective practice area. And a practice area is not a room. You don't need a room, but you do need a spot that is for practice. So interesting enough, I have two practice areas in my home, and both are identical. They have a music stand. They have, um, they have um, something to always work on. Always have something to work on. So if you sit there, you know, don't always rely on your phone or your tablet, you know, or your computer to find information. Have something. Print it out. Have it there. When you have five, ten minutes, put that time in there. Um, I I keep a guitar and a, a stool just in an area. I don't I don't have pedals, right? I find that this stuff behind me, this is the distraction from practicing. 
right? Um, if you're messing with your tone, that's not practicing, <laughs> right? If you're messing with the amp controls, that's not practicing, right? So um, I use a, a Champion 40 right now. I always have some kind of solid state kind of amp, you know, right? Um, you don't have to specifically have an, an amp for practicing, but a practice area is important. So you just pick a spot that can't be disturbed. That's the trick because it's not about... Um, it's not about being isolated from people. It's about that when you go there, it's it's there. And it's really tough if you have little kids because they disturb everything in the house. So you have to find a spot that when you, you know, right now, if you were standing somewhere in the house, if you went right to it, you know it's ready to start practice and just start practicing. Because, you know, my I've always looked at this over the years. My opportunities to practice are sporadic, right? Uh, wife's taking the kids to go get ice cream for 20 minutes. That's 20 minutes of practice time. So there you go. Um, okay, what else? Let's do three more questions and we'll call it. What do we got? Uh, <laughs> I'm just going to read the comment. What? Tone chasing isn't practice? Mm, nope. <laughs> you know, right? We, that's what we should do. We should make a shirt that says, if you spent more time on eBay and Reverb than you did practicing, maybe you got it wrong. Uh, and, and that's a good reminder for all of us. Um, Oh, Tony says nothing ever cracks in Oregon. Yeah, you know, right? It's, you know, if, if I can tell you right now in, in in Arizona, where most of the repair customers come from, are people who move here. You move here from Florida to here, and um, it's so common. So you know, this is so common that I don't even let people finish the statement. They come in and they go, "Yeah, I moved here from," blah blah blah, and I was sitting watching TV, and I go, and you heard a pop, and they go, "Yeah," and I looked over, my guitar cracked, and I'm like, "Yep," I go, it just dried out too fast, man. It's where you live in the desert. Uh, Lewis says, Hey, Phil, is a community college a good place to start a music education? Um, Lewis, uh, the only advice I will give you is the same advice I would give as given my son and give anybody else, which is this, um, keep costs low. Okay. So as someone who's been in business for a long time and, 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 and I joined the army to get the college fund, the GI bill, I use that. Um, I, I'm not, I don't recommend anybody to go to the service to get the college fund or GI bill or, or not recommend anybody. That's not what that's about. But what I will tell everybody is keep your, your, your thing with music is if you're passionate about music, that's great, but musicians do not usually make a lot of money. So keep, don't go get a hundred thousand dollar loan to make 30,000 a year. That's the only advice I can give you. So try to figure out what you're going to make. Try to keep the college in, under control. So is community college a good place to start? Absolutely, right? You can get some core curriculum classes out of the way. Uh, it keeps the budget under control. And when you're doing loans, just keep in mind that's real money uh, and you do have to pay it back and it's it's nasty. And uh, there you go. Uh, Yanni said, T-shirt update. Yanni, I... Um, I don't know uh, with the t-shirts. I'm still going on the same mission as what I talked about. We, I don't know what we're going to do. I think the going plan now is I always take what you guys say and I, I listen to it and I kind of morph it into something I think that can work. Um, and we talked about discontinuing the logo of the shirts and doing a new shirt at 100,000 subscribers. Uh, we're 6,000 subscribers away, 7,000 subscribers away. I'm not sure how many subscribers we have right now. Anyways, I'm, I'm a while away. It's at least two months out. Uh, before we hit 100,000 subscribers. So, um, and that's at the least, right? So, you know, and um, uh, so anyways, uh, I, I am going with that plan. Uh, whether it'll be some version of that plan, I don't know. At the very least, uh, I will change the shirts, but I think what I'm going to do is add more shirts, uh, different styles at 100,000. And then, like I said, the, 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 the official logo, this logo, um, it, it, it will, if it doesn't go away, it'll change enough to where people will be able to be identified as being a pre hundred thousand subscriber for the shirts. There's the, so there you go. Um, and like I said, I will let you guys know you, of course, will be the first to know. This is how I communicate with all you, um, for when you guys hang out with me, uh, uh, showman says, Hey, slap the, uh, like button showman. I'm, uh, I'm working out if I'm going to the NAM show summer. So I might see you, uh, we'll see. I, I, I just started talking to somebody today. I wasn't sure if I was going and I'm, I'm putting it in my, my craw to do it. Uh, let's see. Um, okay. Last two questions. Cause we got off topic. Uh, uh, Ed Bailey, just cause I think you answered a bunch of times and I don't want to 
Uh, it says, hey, Phil, Gibson Thunderbird versus Epiphone T-Bird Pro. From what I see, they have the same guts. Yeah, that's my experience too. Um, my personal thing with the Epiphone versus Gibsons is I've always said this. I like Gibson headstocks better looking than Epiphone headstocks, but Epiphone guitars are fantastic. However, in that model, the headstocks look the same. So, uh, you know, I say Epiphone. Uh, so when you say verse, I don't know, Epiphone, um, you know, it's tough because everybody's got a different budget. I, I, I don't want to be hypocrite. I really love Epiphones more than Gibsons, but I tend to own Gibsons over Epiphones. I, but I don't claim to, to make sense. <laughs> um, uh, Steven says, hey, I finally caught a live broadcast. Just wanted to say thanks uh, for the hour's entertainment. You're welcome, Steve. Thank you for, for checking out the live broadcast. And um, and uh, thank you for supporting the channel. And then the last one. Um, Okay, real quick, this is a question. Simon wants to know where you can get a t-shirt. Simon, they're on every single video I have. There's a link to buy a t-shirt. You just click it, pay uh, T-Chip, and then it, it's a campaign. When it ends, they ship the shirts out. It takes a couple weeks, um, but it's, uh, it's a huge support for the channel. Um, uh, some of you guys ask about doing Patreon and stuff. I do Patreon, you know, because I, I, it's just like, a, just like today, it's a tip jar. Um, however... You know, I like I'm trying to I'm trying to find ways to not just ask you guys for money to actually get support through the channel through doing something. That's an ideal. Although I really appreciate the the Patreon guys. We did some T-shirt giveaways. I try to do something special for you guys as well. Um, and then last question, just because he's answered asked a bunch of time. The question was, what do you think about the Dan Electro with the NOS pickups? I I actually skipped that question because I don't I don't know. Um, I I. I don't know or is because the reason i don't know is are is the dan electros i have do they have nos pickups or is that something different i didn't pay attention to that so um so there you go uh so i don't have a really firm and the last question this is the very last one ready uh, oh, two, because there's an update and a question, so I'll do the update. Paul Smith said, hey, what happened with the website? I already explained that, but I'll keep explaining it. I'm merging with another website company. Uh, in other words, uh, the website is built. We just didn't put it online because we found an opportunity to merge with another company. So our, our thing will be housed in another website, and that will allow me more time to work with it. So, okay, ready? Here's the last question. It says, do you buy something every time you go into a guitar store? And the answer is no, not every time. I used to, though. Uh, when I say used to, I used to buy picks, right? Always did something, always did. Um, um, but no, uh, it just looks like I do. Um, you know, actually, over time, you it gets harder and harder to buy something because you're like, ah, I've kind of owned it or tried it. And, um, you know, it's, it's cool. Um, but I will tell you, and that's why I'll leave on this last note, I will tell you a trick I've always done. If I, a uh, little secret, and I'll do a video probably about this uh, separate, but this is just for you guys. Um, there's something I've always done in music stores, and I really suggest it to everyone. If you ever go into a music store and it's your first time being in the music store and you find something you like, okay, to buy, the, the thing I always do is I go to the counter and I buy a pack of picks. I physically buy them, pay for them and everything, okay? I say, hey, I need a pack of picks. And it's always the picks I use. I just take the whatever pick I use and I buy a pack of picks or I buy some picks. And then... Now that I've bought picks, my logic is, okay, I'm a customer in the store. They know I'm a customer, and they know I buy. I know this sounds silly, but it, trust me, it works, especially on both sides of the counter. I can tell you it's effective. And then I, I go and try the instrument that I know I'm going to buy, and then I go to the salesperson and I say, okay, I really want to buy this guitar. And what I find psychologically is instead of someone who's kicking the tires, now they know I'm a buyer. Even if I only buy picks, they know I buy stuff. It's a technique. I always had it felt well because – it's so much easier to do that than walk up and go, what's your best price on this, right? Because you're trying to get a deal, right? I'm not trying to beat anybody's, uh, you know, profit to death, but, you know, I want to get it. I want to save some money like anyone else. So I, I'm going to ask for the deal every time. I'm going to ask for something, right, to see, right? If, they, if I want it bad enough and they say no, I'm still going to get it. But at least I want to ask. And so I find that if they, they know I'm a customer, they know I'm a bot fix, it still leaves that out. It works almost every time. Uh, they all to say, Hey, what's, uh, you know, um, I, and I never ask them how long they've had the guitar. No cliches to me. It's always just, Hey, um, 
is there anything you can do for this guitar? Any prices? And I l- ask to see what they say. If they say, what are you thinking? Then I, I take my, you know, my, my shot. If they give me an offer, if it's better than mine, then I go. And if it's not as good, I still throw my offer out. So there you go. Um, so I thought, there you go. Especially during this weekend, because there's sales probably a lot of week on this weekend, if you're here in the U.S. As always, guys... Thank you guys for hanging out with me this Friday. I like doing these on Fridays. If you want, tomorrow I will be on In The Blues' channel uh, doing a live feed. It's 6 o'clock uh, my time in Arizona time. So uh, I have no idea what's going to go on. I just know the Tone King's on there. It's In The Blues is doing it. He he asked me if I want to jump on. I was like, absolutely. Who knows what we could do uh, or, or talk about <laughs> right? what we're going to do. I have no idea. Um, but I'm a huge fan of both the Tone King and In the Blues, so of course that's why I'm doing it. Uh, if you're not familiar with those channels, check them out. I'll put those in the links. As always, uh, I want to thank you guys so much for your time and know your gear. <laughs>